This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. So the issues hopefully are resolved with Starleaf and we'll be able to function as normal. Uh, and just keep the microphones muted um, on, until it's time to speak because you know you crack yourself at interferes. Uh, today's meeting will be a, depart, a departmental oral briefing on the programme for government. Consideration of uh, SR, deep, two departmental written briefings, as well as the committee consideration of the work on the review of the independent panels. And we'll move into closed session towards the end of the meeting to discuss the forward work programme and the uh, strategic planning. Um, okay, folks, can we just make sure we're muted until it's turn to speak? Um, okay. Okay, uh, Claire, you're very welcome. Um, okay, members, can I ask uh, broadcasting to place us in open session? And Stella, can you confirm with me whenever we are in open session, please? Sorry, I'm on mute. I'm public now. We're in public now. Uh, okay, members. Um, very welcome to this, the weekly meeting of the ERA committee. And we know from uh, our previous meetings that this will be broadcast, uh, recorded and broadcast through apartment buildings and online. Uh, so welcome to anybody who's listening in online. Uh, and we know that the, the usual, you keep the mobile devices muted and in airplane mode, um, keep everything muted and keep your, your star leaf muted until it's time to speak to inhibit or we can minimize background noise. Uh, we have no uh, apologies for t uh, today's meeting. Uh, everyone full full class, full attendance. Uh, item two in the agenda, chairperson's business. Uh, I want to refer members to the note of the roundtable discussion with members of the BEIS committee and other devolved administrations on the 15th of March to discuss the um, the Net Zero and US Climate Summits. Uh, that can be found at page five. Are members okay to note this? Uh, I want to advise members that the meeting uh, for the first, that the meeting packed for the first meeting following Easter re recess will issue a day later than usual due to committee staff taking leave over the Easter period. Are members okay with that? I'd say so. Okay, um, draft minutes. I want to refer members to the draft minutes from the meeting on the 18th of March, page 12. Can uh, I seek agreement for those minutes? Yeah. And I'll send the minutes physically when I'm up there at the next opportunity. Uh, item five, uh, we're going to have an oral session now from the uh, department on the programme for government. I want to refer members to the memo from Stella at page, 20, 20, at page 22, uh, papers from the department at page 26, and submission from the um, uh, Friends of the Earth at page 34. Um, I want to welcome by Starleaf, um, Aaron Wright, Director of Green Growth, Dave Foster, Director of Regulatory and Natural Resources, Michael McCallion, the Head of Waste, and David Kyle, DVO International Trade Facilitation. And I want to invite the officials to begin the briefing, and members uh, will ask some questions thereafter. So. Dave, Michael, and David, you're very welcome to the committee this morning. Th thank you, Chairman. Uh, it's uh, Aaron Wright speaking. Oh, uh, can, folk, sorry. can folk hear me okay? Yeah, sorry, Aaron, if you're a the area, you're very welcome. Yes, we can hear you loud and clear. Great. Uh, th thanks very much, Chairman. Uh, listen, on behalf of the team, I'd like to thank the committee uh, for the invitation to meet with you today. Um, we welcome the opportunity to come along and share some of the ways in which we believe the department's work will contribute to programme for government uh, and to hear members' views on this. Uh, I plan to give you uh, an overview of, of how we've been engaging with uh, the Executive Office and with other departments uh, to develop the Programme for Government Draft Outcomes Framework and also highlight some of the their work streams uh, that will help deliver it. So in doing this, uh, I'll refer to the briefing paper provided to members, uh, I'll touch on how the department is addressing the, uh, the new decade, new approach commitments. Um, how using green growth uh, as an example, uh, we're putting processes in place to embed the uh, collaborative working across departments. Uh, 
Almost all of the outcomes will require the involvement of a number of departments uh, if they are to be realised. Uh, and members will note from Annex B in the briefing paper that the department will input to eight of the proposed nine outcomes. And cross-cutting strategies like green growth and food will contribute to most of them. Uh, I suppose to make the help uh, the, the session as informative as possible for members, I've, I've been joined by Dave Foster and uh, Michael McCallion, who lead on natural environment and waste and plastics policy, and David Kyle, who leads on the international engagement and trade facilitation work. So all of these areas cut across a number of programme for government outcomes, and I plan to touch on a few uh, during the briefing today. Members will be aware that the Programme for Government is the executive's highest level strategic plan, uh, setting ambitious direction for government to deliver long-term outcomes that people want to see. So achieving this will require collaborative working across government and um, with its partners over many years and be underpinned by a series of strategies, policies and programmes and a corresponding budget. Uh, Annex B shows the strategies and policies the department either has in place or, or in development linked to each outcome. Uh, and at this stage, uh, programmes for delivery and the budget are yet to be determined. The Executive Office, who lead on, on programme for government, are following the process outlined in New Decade, New Approach, ensuring that there is widespread engagement and co design uh, in that process. It's involved workshops, uh, feedback sessions and citizen surveys and I just wanted to ensure, assure the committee the department here has been fully engaged throughout and provided in, uh, input uh, to the framework which issued for consultation on in December and, and which closed uh, I think on Tuesday past. Uh, I understand that the Executive Office hopes to be close to a final version of the Outcomes Framework by the end of April, uh, which will allow us to begin identifying the appropriate actions. And we'll aim to complete uh, this work and enable PFG to be brought before uh, the summer. Uh, and we'd be happy to return to the committee in advance of that to outline the, the actions the department plans to take uh, and to seek members' views. The consultation on the draft budget uh, for 21-22 has concluded. Uh, and the, the final budget is due to be agreed by the executive before the end of, of this month. Uh, at present, the draft st strategic uh, program for government excludes associated expenditure targets. So at this stage, it, it's not possible to determine how the departmental contributions to program for government will be reflected in the budget. Um, DARE's draft business plan for 21-22 has used the PFG outcomes to frame its targets and once approved by the Minister, it will be presented to the committee for, for your consideration. Work's also begun on the first of DARE's five-year plans to achieve strategic aims set out in its uh, multi-decade strategy, Sustainability for the Future, DARE's plan to 2050, which was shared with the committee last month. And once finalised, the new PFG outcomes will feature heavily in the first of our five-year plans. Our purpose um, remains sustainability at the heart of a living, working, active landscape valued by everyone, um, which is reflected in the department's strategic priorities, which are to support food, forestry, fishery and farming sectors in contributing to a sustainable economy, uh, to protect and enhance our environment, to champion thriving rural communities and to be people focused, making a difference to those we serve. And I want to now focus on, on uh, some examples of how furthering these priorities, the department is progressing the program for government outcomes. The current uh, outcomes delivery plan, which was developed uh, in the absence of the assembly, provided departments with an outcomes focus. Uh, and so th this kind of model isn't new, uh, it isn't new to us. As outcomes are long-term, aspirational and generational, many of them uh, in the ODP have carried across into the new uh, draft outcomes framework. And this is reassuring because it demonstrates policy goals are largely aligned with people's expectations as they should be. Annex A of your briefing paper includes a table showing some of the indicators associated with outcome two of the ODP. Uh, we live and work sustainably protecting the environment which has carried across into the new program for government. The department has lead responsibility for the outcome uh, and five of the six indicators there. And these include waste and recycling, uh, air quality, water quality, greenhouse gas emissions and biodiversity. And both Dave and Michael have been involved in this work. 
But the department also makes a significant contribution to other outcomes too. Um, so for example, the, the application of the sanitary, phytosanitary and public health requirements underpins our valuable export markets and keeps trade flowing. And this is a challenge at any time, but has become more significant as we manage the transition following EU exit. Recently, this has included uh, working toward recovering international disease freedom following the avian uh, influenza outbreaks here and regaining access to the pork market in China for one of our pig processors, the first premises in the UK to be approved since the COVID outbreak. Uh, also putting safeguards in place for the use of critically important uh, antimicrobials helps ensure that sustainability and future efficacy of life-saving drugs. Through CAFRI, we ensure that young people entering uh, a career in the agri-food industry have a broad range of knowledge and skills, which equips them to make real impact. And CAFRI also delivers a wide range of knowledge transfer and innovation programs to those working in the industry to drive economic performance in line with ensuring improved environmental performance. So all of which deliver towards the outcomes linked to global competitiveness, uh, children and young people, and, and health. New Decade New Approach makes a specific commitment to tackle climate change head on with a strategy to address the immediate and longer term impacts. Green growth will be that strategy. This is because tackling climate change needs a holistic approach requiring transformation of our society and economy that also addresses the challenges facing our environment. And achieving this will make a difference to people's quality of life, living up to the overall aim of Programme for Government. Members received a written update on the development of Green Growth Strategy last month and will have received the draft strategy framework document, I think as written briefing uh, for, for today's session. It outlines the approach and timeline for developing the strategy and we'd welcome uh, members' views on this document uh, and plan to return to the committee with an update on progress uh, in uh, early in May. By its very nature, the, this work is cross-cutting, involving many sectors of the economy, society, and multiple departments. And in keeping with the scale of the challenge, uh, it will be a multi-decade uh, executive strategy led by DERA, um, uh, reflecting our perm secretary's role uh, as the proposed owner for the uh, environment outcome. It will also be uh, embedded in other major strategies, such as that of investment, uh, energy, uh, and the Economic Recovery Action Plan. However, realising green growth will require more than strategies and plans. It needs ownership and commitment toward a shared vision of the future, and that means real partnership working at all levels. Minister Putz has established an interministerial group to provide the necessary direction and decision making. A strategic oversight group has also been created, comprised of senior officials from a range of departments. Um, its role is to align policies and make sure these and the funding that supports them remain outcome focused. A forum for external representative bodies, organisations and local government stakeholders has also been created to engage the views and interests of the private and voluntary community sectors. We feel that these structures will help ensure the collaborative and collegiate relationships required to deliver the outcomes. Uh, the Climate Change Committee's sixth carbon budget makes recommendations on how Northern Ireland can make a fair and equitable contribution to UK government commitment to achieve net zero emissions by 2050. And it identifies the sectoral challenges and points towards areas where gains are most likely to be made. The agriculture sector here uh, faces particular challenges, largely due to the importance of, of livestock farming. However, these challenges go beyond greenhouse gas emissions and extend to the production of ammonia uh, and excess nutrients, uh, which affect water quality and air quality uh, and can damage the environment. So the department, through the development of its future agriculture policy, will assist the industry in meeting these challenges and avail of opportunities uh, it presents. And like the for us for our future, it is hoped that this too will become a foundation program for green growth. So Chairman, that concludes my opening remarks. Okay. Uh, thank you, Aaron, uh, for that briefing and for the, the written briefing that, uh, that you provided to the, the committee uh, in advance of today. Um, I just want to maybe just reference back, Aaron, just the, just the last couple of points that you made there. Um, in relation to, uh, obviously, future agriculture policy um, and also ammonia, 
when, when are we likely to see the ammonia action plan published? Um, I, I'm, I, I don't know, Dave, if that's one that you can pick up on. Yep. Thank you, Aaron. Uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, Chair, you, you were asking about the uh, ammonia action plan. Um, yeah. Certainly, um, we've been working uh, quite hard on the uh, draft of a discussion document on the future ammonia, ammonia action plan. Um, uh, it's uh, very close to c uh, completion. Uh, and I know that Minister's um, hoping to launch that very soon. Um, yeah, thank you, Dave. Have you any idea of when soon? Because we were told that back in the summer. <laughs> Yeah, uh, uh, granted, yeah, w w w uh, officials have just uh, recently updated the document to reflect uh, 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 one or two changes since the summer uh, to make sure that it's as updated as it can be um, to reflect, for instance, the fact that we recently consulted on the uh, discussion document on the clean air strategy. Uh, so those updates have just been completed. Uh, and so, you know, with the minister's consideration, I know that he's keen to uh, start the discussion uh, via the consultation as, as soon as is possible. Okay, uh, um, and just secondly, uh, in relation to the um, Ireland made reference to the future agriculture policy, see the fact that we, because we've left the the uh, EU, um, we don't have a common agriculture policy here, um, but we, we also don't we don't have our own agriculture act here, and we have been we're, we're waiting for months as well for the publication of uh, a new rural policy. Can you give me any indication of um, when we might see the draft publication of both an agriculture policy and a rural policy? And and surely, uh, in the with the vacuum that's been created by by that by by, by EU exit and by the fact we don't have those policy, does that uh, does, does that not sort of impede our our, our um, commitments or our PFG commitments or indeed? Our, our progress towards meeting uh, the various outcomes? Um, well, in terms of the, the timeline, uh, Chairman, uh, I, I think that, uh, you know, certainly the work that's ongoing on, on future agriculture policy, uh, it's, it's, there's a lot of strands to that, um, a, a lot of uh, elements to it. Um, I think that sort of, uh, you know, as we move through, uh, there's a lot of engagement happening right across the department uh, at this stage. I mean, that, that policy will be being worked up, um, you know, over, over, you know, the coming months. Um, I'm not cited on the, the detail of that, um, but I can certainly try and come back to you with a bit more uh, on it. Um, you, you mentioned, is it holding up program for government? Uh, I, I can say that at this point, um, it's not holding up development uh, delivery of program for government um, but uh, you know for us to really start to uh, you know to get into the, the long-term detailed actions that are required to deliver on climate change and environmental improvements uh, you know we really need uh, you know the policy uh, and the programs behind that to start that that, that, that ball rolling um, and and we are looking at, at how we can do that now even currently within within the budgets that we have. That's great. Uh, thank you, Aaron. I'm going to move around the room now. And the first person who indicated they wanted to ask a question is Morris. Morris? Morris, you, you're, you can unmute now. There we go. Sorry, I apologize. Thank you, Chair. You OK, Morris? Uh, a question for Aaron. And it's uh, around the, the protect, uh, protection of the environment. Uh, the marine strategy and fishery strategy. What progress has been made, if any, to reduce the levels of phosphorus in our rivers and dissolve nitrogen in marine waters? And another major concern I have had has been the amount of and the high levels of ammonia throughout Northern Ireland, which you've already raised, Chair. So maybe, Aaron, if you could give us some indication on how the department plans to reduce the, the level of phosphorus and nitrogen in our uh, rivers and coastal waters. Uh, uh, yes, indeed. Um, I'm gonna I'm gonna uh, 
divert to Dave for that because I think uh, there's quite a bit of work going on on that side, exactly on the subjects of uh, you know soil nutrient management uh, and, and reduction of phosphates and nitrates um, within the sort of uh, the agricultural systems uh, and how that will impact water quality and, and air quality. So I'll, ha I'll hand over to Dave if he's happy. Yep. Certainly. Um, yep. So uh, the member was asking about uh, phosphorus and, and, and nitrogen, um, which are, are both currently indicators in the current program for government uh, in terms of water quality. And I think that it, um, you know discussions with the statisticians have indicated that, that, that you know they're likely to re remain as indicators in the new program for government. Uh, so that that indicates then you know, the importance that they have in in terms of uh, demonstrating uh, progress, or otherwise in, in terms of the water environment. Um, I think in, in terms of the you know, the trends currently, um, you know, I think the briefing paper shows that you know that, that there hasn't been a, a, a positive um, statistical change in in nutrient concentrations in fresh waters for phosphorus and marine waters for, for nitrogen. Um, so uh, there's certainly more to do there. Um, uh, there are a number of initiatives ongoing at the moment that will hopefully, um, as they come to fruition, uh, start to turn the curve in relation to, to uh, nutrients. Um, so in, in terms of the, the regulatory approach, you obviously have the, the Nutrients Action Program, uh, the, the NAP, uh, which was updated just over 18 months ago and included some uh, updated requirements in relation to spreading of nutrients, uh, particularly a, a move over a number of years to increase use of low emission spreading techniques. Um, the department's just run a, a further tranche of the FAS, FAIS scheme uh, to support a, a move to that technology uh, and uh, interest and take it up of that has been, uh, has been very strong. Uh, so I think that indicates that the you know, industry recognizes that there's more needs to be done uh, and uh, are looking to invest in technologies and allow them to do that. Uh, we also have the on the uh, on the um, on the voluntary side of things, as opposed to the regulatory side of things, we have the environmental farming scheme uh, and particular EFS wider, um, which looks to uh, you know support uh, actions, uh, for instance, um, uh, um, buffer strips uh, and the like, which will reduce nutrient. Um, uh, cover, sorry, nutrient input um, from farm fields to water courses, uh, and uh, the department, uh, subject to business case approval, are looking to launch further tranches of that this year and, and next year. Uh, and, and Aaron mentioned there, just in terms of uh, soil quality, um, ultimately, you know, the, the most important thing is to have the right amount of nutrients uh, in, a, in the right places uh, on fields at the right time, uh, so that you know, it maximizes. The uh, productivity for the farmer uh, minimizes any excess nutrients entering water courses uh, and the key way to, to understand that is by having a, a good detailed understanding of um, soil uh, nutrient concentrations. Uh, the department uh, um, a couple of years ago ran uh, two um, uh, pilot soil sampling schemes uh, which were, we, we found successful in giving farmers the right information uh, in terms of um, soil concentrations and then overlaying with um, LIDAR maps to actually show where the runoff risks were on farm. Uh, and we're working, uh, the minister is very keen that this uh, launches uh, in a timely manner to set up a, a further scheme uh, to roll that out over a number of years uh, across Northern Ireland to provide a baseline of information for soil nutrients, uh, which will then underpin uh, um, further schemes under the new agricultural policy that Aaron referred to there in the previous question. Um, so I hope that gives a, a, a quick overview of uh, existing programs and, and future programs that, that will tackle that particular um, PFG indicator, uh, which is obviously a, a very important one for the water environment, both in fresh waters and marine. Yeah, th thanks very much, Dave. Uh, just to follow up, if it's all right with the chair there, do you think that the department is placing enough uh, emphasis on the reduction of phosphorus and nitrates? Uh, I mean, it's a, it's, a, it's a preventable problem, but there's not enough been done to prevent it. Would that be a fair comment? 
it, it is a preventable problem. Um, yes, you, you, you're right. Um, I think it's, it's, it's recognised um, that you know more, more needs to be done. Um, you know, the, the the regulatory approach has been around for a number of years, and you know, uh, as I intimated earlier, we're looking to you know have recently updated the controls on that and tighten those. Um, you know, we think there's three strands to that: the regulatory, the voluntary, and, and the education. Uh, and those three strands, you know, give us the best opportunity to, to you know, to, to prevent excess nutrients. But the fundamental, I think, is if farmers have the right information, um, they can make the right behavioural changes um, because there's, there's no benefit in them uh, losing nutrients to water courses when if it's in the right place on on their on their fields is actually going to be doing them economic benefit. Um, so it, 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 it's been a long-term problem. That's uh, you know the case uh, across most of Europe, um, and we do need to focus more on it. Uh, and, and that's why the minister is very keen that the, the, the soil health scheme uh, launches to you know provide the sort of the the information part of the picture to you know, to to go in tandem with the regulatory part under the NAP. Uh, and then the opportunity for farmers to to do things on on the farm um, in via schemes like EFS. To, to use the information they get from their uh, from their soil samples to make some you know, positive changes for, for their own farm business and also the environment. Okay, thank you very much. Do you have, Chair, that'll do me in the meantime. Thank you, uh, um, Morris. Okay, uh, John, John Blair. And, and thank uh, the DERA representatives with us also. I, I have two questions, uh, Chair. The first one relates to point 10 of the briefing provided and that that, that uh, briefing at that point tells me that the uh, Independent Environmental Protection Agency promised a new decade, new approach will be dealt with further down the line in a future uh, programme for government. Can I ask if that was a departmental or ministerial decision or both? Um, how it was reached and when, if it was publicly announced prior to today or if it will be at some point in the future? Uh, I'm going to again. I'm going to come to to Dave for that. I think uh, Dave's been involved in some of the uh, of the work around uh, you know the the office of environmental protection, and uh, I think he's in a in a place maybe to to provide some comment. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, thank you, thank you, Aaron. Um, certainly, the the um, the focus the minister has at, at the moment uh, is on uh, he, he recognises the importance of good environmental governance uh, as we have now left the EU, uh, and the you know the focus I think he has is ensuring that the, uh, the the functions that were previously carried out by the EU uh, in relation to the Commission and the European Court of Justice uh, are, are mirrored. Uh, it, it, it post exit, uh, and hence the uh, the, you know, the work on the um, UK Environment Bill and the Offices for Our Protection. Um, and I think you've had br briefing on that. There's been a recent consultation on um, principles uh, and governance around that, uh, and uh, you know uh, officials are, are working to establish the OEP. Um, you know, uh, and um, the chair designate has been across, I think, as maybe members. Um, so uh, the minister's uh, um, approach is that um, the, the um, OEP it will, will change the the, uh, the way you know governance for the environment uh, occurs over here, uh, and it would be you know appropriate to let that be established and bed in, and then see what further changes in environmental governance uh, are needed. Uh, in the context of the New Deal, uh, New Decade, New Deal um, um, requirement around an independent environment protection agency. Um, so, uh, you know, I think he wants to see how things bed in, uh, and then consider, you know, it, perhaps in the next mandate and, and the next program for government, uh, for what further changes are needed, uh, and scope those out. Um, you, you also asked, um, you know, to the extent that that had been announced. Um, I, I think there's been um, a number of assembly questions on that. Um, and we can certainly come back to you and, uh, you know, just in, in indicate, you know, uh, where that's been referenced previously. Okay, yeah, yeah. I'm not questioning the, the role or, or obviously not the existence of the OEP, but I, I'm concerned that if uh, new decade, new, new, new approach commitments are being um, dropped, 
then there should be a public uh, announcement of that and the rationale for that decision should also be made clear. So, so hopefully hopefully that can be clarified along with whether it was ministerial or departmental or, or both and whether or not that was shared at executive level also would be very keen if that information could be provided in, in more detail. The second question it relates to the subject of waste management. And there are a number of issues around this. First of all, point four of the briefing, it's listed as an indicator. But then on Annex B, I think it is, um, let me double check here. Um, there don't appear to be any direct action listed at Annex B in relation to that target, uh, separate to, of course, green growth. Um, whilst it's listed as a key priority area at Annex B, um, I don't see a matching action. That, that, that's a concern to me because later on today, we're, we're going to be looking at, in relation to the green growth strategy, the contribution of waste to, to, to greenhouse gases. And whilst they are a relatively small proportion, there is not in the nine-year targets that we'll be looking at later any declared intention to reduce that proportion. So keen to know why it's not highlighted better in the in the presentation. Uh, uh, Michael, I'll is that something that, yeah. that you can uh, provide a response on? Yeah, yeah, I'll pick up on that one. Yeah, I mean, um, the package itself, as I say, uh, uh, it, it's hard to outline every uh, detail that's going on as regards uh, all indicators, but I can assure you uh, we are, you know, producing a uh, package as such, uh, you know, to make sure that we're increasing our recycling. I mean, if you look at the circular economy package, it, it actually uh, makes sure that uh, the into legislation now by we have to have a target of 65% by 2035. So we have a lot of initiatives going on. I mean, and a lot that's happening at the minute. I mean, you may have seen yesterday the extended producer responsibility and the deposit return schemes, they were launched. Uh, there's other actions going on at the minute. Uh, we're working with RAP uh, and we're currently looking at uh, how we can actually, we sent out a discussion document on the future recycling and separate collection of waste. Uh, so again, as I say, there, there's a lot of initiatives going on. There's a lot of actions going on, behavior change campaigns, et cetera, as well. And we're working, you know, with various partners on that one. So sorry if it isn't outlined on that, but certainly, as I say, uh, uh, it's not for the lack of work that's ongoing uh, within the department to ensure that we meet these, as I say, the circular economy package. Uh, and as you'll see over uh, the previous program for government, it was something that we uh, made good steps on. And it's something that we want to ensure, you know, in the upcoming yeah. program for government that we've all done. So thanks, Michael, for that, and, and uh, that, that gives me some reassurance. But if I could try and drill down on that just briefly, and, and then I, I, I will finish with this question. Um, is there any effort being made to ensure consistency on, on waste management handling and consistency across council areas? I have pointed out uh, to many before with, with uh, other representatives that uh, currently there are disparities even within individual council areas. On, on how recycling is collected and managed, let alone across the the, the council areas in general and the, and the region in general. So for that reason, I have to ask, is there any question about how the waste management structures could do this better or if they might have to be reviewed? And I mean, I mean the, the, the group management systems but when I ask that, by the way. I uh, think we might have lost Michael there, which is a shame because that's... <laughs> I, really didn't mean, I really didn't mean to scare him off. Yeah, scared him, yeah, scared him off, John. Uh, no, uh, uh, we, if, 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 I'm sure he'll be able to get back in. Uh, if not, we'll, we'll, we'll take a note of that and get back to you on that one because it, it, it is an area that Michael knows about. I mean, I think that the other point that was being made earlier just uh, in relation to... Um, uh, the uh, circular economy uh, work. Uh, I mean, we, we're working closely with DFE, Michael, and, and the team in there with, with Colin Rayner working cl closely with DFE on the circular economy strategy. Um, uh, and uh, although uh, we, we're, it's it's not mentioned in Annex B because we've we've kind of limited that to to the DARE led strategies um, uh, and not all the strategies that we that we feed into and work with. So that 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 probably you know might help explain a bit of the omission in, in that uh, yeah, yeah. Annex B. I'm I, I, not Aaron and thanks for that, but but uh, if I am going to have more information sent to me, I'm particularly yeah. 
keen to know about how we're going to review the waste management set up and structures in yeah. Northern Ireland because they're, they're not hitting the mark, to put it bluntly, if there's disparity within individual council areas, let, let alone across the, the group systems. Okay. Sorry, John, I'm back in now. I, lo I lost my uh, connection there for a minute. Yeah, John, that is something that we are looking at. I mean, as I say, we've recently went out with a discussion document as to how we can, uh, you know, improve upon uh, the current uh, waste, both quality and quantity. So, yes, uh, we're actually working on that, uh, that discussion document. Uh, I think it was closed about a couple of weeks ago, so we're actually drawing that one up and seeing, uh, you know, what initiatives and what actions we can take. So, so you're totally correct. It's something that we do need to address, and we do recognise we are addressing. Michael, thank you for that, and thanks for coming back to tell me. Okay. Okay, John. Thanks, that. Claire. Claire. Um, great. Listen, I want to go back to uh, just stick with that um, the nitrogen uh, and uh, I know that we all know that there's been no change in levels of phosphorus and nitrogen in marine water. Um, and I'm just wondering, is there in the in the department's climate change bill, will it contain specific targets on water quality and nitrogen? I, ahead, can come in that, Claire. Yeah, I can come in that, Claire. Claire, I think, I mean, uh, my colleague Colin Breen uh, and his team briefed you last week. And again, uh, from, you know, from what he said is we're specifically looking at an overall greenhouse gas emissions target, uh, not breaking it down specifically into, as you say, nitrogen, etc. So at the minute, as I say, uh, it's specifically looking at an overall greenhouse gas emissions target. Okay, and we know then that there's been no change in, in our greenhouse gas emissions since 2015. But then I'm thinking that so the, the nitrogen and soil qualities, and so if we're looking at sustainability at the heart of everything, as was mentioned, and then ammonia was brought up there as well, um, and this inter-ministerial working group uh, on what they're go doing. So we've known for a long time, for example, that ammonia is a huge problem and it's causing serious damage not just to human health but to our environment and biodiversity and we know that the environment agency's internal policy on the critical levels that planners have to use to assess anaerobic digester applications for example that 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 internal policy hasn't been legally proved so setting that critical level between one and ten um is applied for each application rather than an overall assessment of the, the levels in an area. Um, so when we're looking for quick wins, uh, and we keep hearing about the ammonia strategy, it's already been brought up by the chair there again, that we haven't seen it um, yet. So can we go for quick wins or what's the, what's the level of thinking about legally proofing internal policies and working with planners to make sure that, you know, damage and planning applications that are currently being passed stop happening? Um, uh, well, uh, I, I'll maybe take the first part part of that. Um, in terms of what we're trying to do with um, with, with green growth, uh, is to have through the interministerial group and, and through the the uh, strategic oversight group uh, and the policy leads um, uh, across the, the different areas of responsibility, is to make sure that that we are aligning those policies um, to to get the kind of outcomes that we. That that we need to get. I think that you know it is fair to say that you know a lot of a lot of work has has been very effective uh, in focused areas uh, up until now. But in some, it's been very very difficult to get the level of uh, of I suppose prioritisation um, across uh, you know across government policy that we really need to, to get that outcomes focus. Um, and that's something that we uh, fully believe that is possible with the approach that, that is now being put in place with green growth. Um, you know, we've had very positive engagement um, with, uh, you know, with, with the, the interministerial group and with the strategic oversight group. People understand that uh, the outcomes are uh, you know, the priority and it's how we go about aligning that and putting the budget uh, into those areas to make these things happen that will be, uh, you know, will be evidence going forward. What would you but maybe, maybe Dave, if you want to sort of touch on the on the ammonia uh, work again. I think you're on mute, Dave. 
Give. Sorry, apologies. Is that better now? Yeah. Sorry, okay. Chair. Um, yeah. Um, yeah, so I appreciate members are obviously very keen to, to see the consultation issue on, on ammonia um, and, you know, look, looking for quick wins within that. Um, you know, there are a number of elements to, you know, addressing the ammonia problem. Um, you, know, they're, they're, you know, there's the, um, if like the, the need to take action and, you know, the consultation will, will set out, you know, concrete actions and an action plan to, to deal with that both at a regional level and then also, you know, what we need to do at a site specific level. Uh, and, you know, the, the, a mixture there of, you know, the regulatory, uh, the education and, and, and the voluntary, um, recognizing that, you know, we need to move quickly on this uh, and, and put forward actions that will have the best opportunity to reduce you know, ammonia by the maximum amount as quickly as possible. Um, there's also a need, you know, like to, to work at habitat restoration as well. Um, so we're you know, uh, uh, recognizing that damage has already been caused, um, you know, uh, particularly, say, for instance, on, on peatland habitats, you know, what can we do to uh, actively um, improve the situation and, and restore those habitats? Uh, and then uh, picking up your point in terms of the, the agency's uh, operational policy, um, you know, certainly the, the consultation will, will um, I think, reference that uh, and, uh, and options for going forward. Um, I think, you know, planners have been involved in those discussions uh, in, in terms of that and, and probably the committee have already uh, had briefing on that previously. But, th th you know, th that's just a, a broad outline of some of the sort of main themes that, that a consultation will, will, will hopefully address, uh, recognising that, you know, it's been a while in its gestation and there's a, a need for quick wins and the department are, are aware of that and recognise that. Yeah, okay, and, and maybe it's not of your doing, but you know, again, I'm going to um, express real frustration because we know about all these problems. We've known about them for a long, long time, and what we're hearing in response is that there's strategies being developed. So we're hearing about um, a climate change bill being drafted, an ammonia strategy. We know that our water quality has failed. We know that our air pollution levels are unsustainable. We know that we know all this stuff, you know, and it's this thing about doing strategies and consulting and strategies and consulting when we know there's very quick wins to be had internally just by simply changing an internal policy that doesn't have a rationale really behind it. So I just wanted to put that on the record. Um, but can I go back to this interministerial working group um, and know then, um, that Aaron, you give us a quick um, quick roundup on that. But can I just go back, who specifically is on the interministerial working group for climate change? Um, when do they meet? How often do they meet? And do they have priority issues that they're looking at? Uh, yes, the, uh, the, the that group currently, uh, we, we've, we've, we've tried to, given that the, all the other, um, I, I guess, uh, pressures that are on across uh, government, you know, we've tried to focus in uh, initially. Uh, certainly on those departments that have, uh, I suppose, most uh, impact potentially uh, on, on, you know, climate and fire. Uh, uh, change. So, uh, apart from uh, the Dairy Minister, we have ministers from infrastructure, communities, uh, economy, uh, and finance. Uh, and obviously, you know, as uh, the, the intention is, as we as we move forward, uh, that we'll have uh, all ministers involved in that. Uh, there has been at this stage um, one meeting of that group. Um, which took place in January. Um, the strategic oversight group of uh, senior officials has met uh, now three times, um, the last being uh, a week before last. So there, there has been engagement and, and we, we would be planning that there'll be another interministerial group uh, possibly um, uh, April, May. And have any priority issues been identified by the group? Well, at, at this stage, the main focus for, for us is looking at uh, the, 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 the climate change piece, um, you know, because that's obviously that's the, the big focus and in the run up to COP26, um, you know, we want to be in a position to clearly state that, um, you know, as part of our green growth strategy development, uh, we want to be working up a, a, a climate action plan for Northern Ireland um, and be in a position to to sort of highlight the key priorities that we feel um, you know we can take forward uh, that will demonstrate Northern Ireland's commitment to to playing its part there. 
Should I just ask a last question then? When we're looking at the, the food strategy framework, and we know that they'll feed into lots of the, the key priority areas in the area. Um, uh, but I'm, I'm thinking, does, does such a framework exist? Um, and out of the first 15 po policies and strategies mentioned by Daria, how many of those have been actually published? As I said, I guess at the beginning uh, in the opening remarks that um, you know what we have here are strat some some of these strategies and policy areas are are, are long standing, and others are in development. And the food policy framework is one that is is in development. Um, you know, there's a heavy uh, alignment with the Department for Economy on this, uh, and and obviously we want to try and, and link into with uh, you know health. Um, and the food aspects there for, for a healthy diet for people, and also in terms of education um, for uh, you know, young people learning about uh, you know the, the importance of diet. So th there's a whole range of aspects there uh, outside of just of just this department. But that's a strategy that is uh, it's going to be uh, you know quite a cross cutting piece of work. Um, we're planning to use uh, the same green growth. Uh, structures that we have, those governance structures, uh, to try and facilitate uh, um, that level of engagement. So we're, we're not going to sort of restrict uh, the, the interministerial group uh, and strategic oversight group just to looking purely at uh, at the, the climate piece. You know, we, we'll be able to bring in food um, uh, as an agenda item to that. that that's the plan at this stage. Um, okay, thanks. And who's on the strategic oversight group then? Well, the senior officials, deputy secretary level, uh, who are the sort of the leads on, uh, for example, uh, you know, agri future agricultural policy, uh, energy policy, uh, economic policy, uh, strategy, uh, and uh, um, uh, and uh, I suppose on the finance side as well, and communities, housing, planning, uh, and transport. Thank you. Thank you, okay, and, uh, Philip. Philip? Philip? Philip has dropped out. All right, no, I'm back. Uh, just following on from some of the points other members ha ha have already made, I mean, obviously, cross departmental working is essential if, if DERA is to achieve its PFT targets. You know, for example, in the outcome two, all uh, to DFI, this is basically saying that 25% of all journeys made by walking, cycling, public transport, you know, will help to uh, contribute to the program for government outcome too. We live and work sustainably, protecting our environment, uh, which is one of the indicators. Can, can I ask just then, in relation to that particular one, can Dira expand, can, or sorry, can you expand on the cross departmental working with DFA on this particular outcome and on this indicator? Um, uh, on that particular indicator, um, I, I I don't have the background knowledge of uh, you, you know what um, uh, you know because D DFI report you know or have been reporting on that on under the um, outcomes delivery plan to date. So I'd need to find that one out uh, and get back to you. Okay, I would appreciate yeah. and yeah, that. I can the lack that. of knowledge maybe. Uh, uh, adds to the, the lack of delivery. Uh, so, I mean, I, I really would appreciate uh, an answer. And just kind of following on then, uh, even expanding on cross-departmental work. And I mean, a lot of the outcomes require cross-departmental work. And so, I mean, we talk about green growth strategy, food strategy, future agriculture policy, environment strategy, all of these, fisheries, marine, etc. So, in terms of, of the, you know, which department is responsible for, you know, the, these outcomes in terms of our, our economy is globally competitive, regionally balanced and carbon neutral. Uh, you know, can you maybe outline which department is responsible for that outcome and how its contribution is measured and assessed? Um, as, for, as far as I understand it, that, that outcome uh, is, is, is not the, the idea going forward is that those won't be departmentally owned. Um, uh, it'll be more that, uh, you know, the, the secretary of, of a department will, will take ownership for that um, and that they will be then sort of, uh, you know, 
ensuring that there, there's a lead role taken there. Um, again, it, it, it comes down to trying to ensure that um, there's an outcome owner rather than a, a kind of a departmental responsibility to try and encourage the uh, Know, improved, uh, you know, cross departmental working. Um, I think DFE, from from understanding, is, is proposed uh, as the lead department in that one thought. Okay, thank you. And then just following on, uh, just uh, from John's question on waste management. Obviously, you'll have seen the report today that uh, is suggesting that through the pandemic, uh, littering across the north has increased as a problem. And I mean, I, I'm I'm aware of my own constituency community groups. Uh, out every weekend uh, doing litter picks and cleaning up litter. I mean, it's, it's a serious problem, which I just can't get my head around. But I mean, has the department uh, considered a, a zero waste strategy, you know, similar to you know, strategies in, in other jurisdictions? I'll pick up on that, Philip. Uh, I mean, as regards uh, litter and et cetera, you're correct. And I mean, what I, what I basically have said earlier as well is, uh, you know, Behavioural change is a very important thing. So what we have basically been doing is we've been working with different partners to get behaviour change, uh, you know, inbuilt. Uh, and there's been various uh, programmes that's been run in that. As regards the waste strategy itself, I mean, waste strategy is something that's upcoming, and I think uh, these are due to be briefed somewhere down the line. Uh, again, unfortunately, it's one that hasn't been able to be uh, forwarded, basically because of. Uh, you know, other pressures, AU, et cetera, but it is on our radar and it is something that we know we have to look at. So as the CEs will be briefed on that one itself uh, whenever that one's been developed. Okay. In, in terms of behavioural change, because, I mean, as I say, I, I just can't get my head around the levels of lettering, uh, particularly in, in public spaces where people go to access uh, the natural environment and particularly in places where there's ample bins for, for placing with. So, I mean, I literally can't get my head around the level of, of, of littering. But it's clear from the increase that whatever our strategy is on behavioural change isn't working and, and we need to do something different. Uh, otherwise, we're just going to get the same results. Maybe uh, if, if I can pick up on that one, um, it, it, you're quite right, Philip. In terms of littering, you know, that, that there has been an increase, um, you know, uh, during lockdown, and uh, uh, we, we've certainly had correspondence from you know uh, a number of stakeholders and, and local councils around this. Um, it, it, we mentioned the environment strategy, um, which we'll, we'll be hopefully consulting on it, it, it later on in the spring. Uh, and certainly w within that, I think we'll be you know, looking as one of the, one of the things, um, you know, the, the issue of littering and whether the the framework we've got at the moment in terms of the you know the sort of statutory regulatory framework and, and the level of fines and the, and the type of uh, restrictions is appropriate um so there's something that's certainly on our agenda in terms of you know do we need to have a, a more update robust littering strategy and, and, and legislation behind that um but ultimately you, you're right you know it, it is behavioral change you know people need to be you know minded to do the right thing um, you know, we we do fund uh, keep Northern Ireland beautiful uh, and their live here love here campaign, uh, which is you know is aiming at behavioural change, uh, and it you know it, it's you know something that they're uh, you know that th they're very um, keen to push forward. Um, you know and the, the happiness, successes, and behavioural change. That, uh, I remember there's a, a campaign in Texas, a long running campaign, don't mess with Texas, which really did have some uh, heart hitting messages. You know, using bikers to sort of, you know, to, to put messages, you know, don't mess with our state. And that sort of civic pride and wanting to do the right thing is ultimately what's going to be needed to be done. Um, but you know, that's the behavioural change piece. Uh, as I say, we're, we're looking at maybe a littering strategy. Uh, are there other initiatives? I mean, I think yesterday we, we launched a consultation on the deposit return scheme. Um, in, in terms of plastic bottles uh, and, and you know working with industry to put in place the infrastructure to make it easier for people to to do the right thing so that you know there's a, a wide variety of you know levers that can and, and ought to be used uh, and I need to link those together um, but you know it, it, ultimately it, you know people's attitudes and behavior will be what uh, you know really delivers on this uh, and you know that that is a, a tricky complex issue as you've rightly recognized Okay, thank you. Thanks. I think on that there, on the waste issue, I agree with Philip. Um, 
it's desperate and it's so unsightly around the country. But I do think the department needs to adopt not just the carrot, but also the stick as well in terms of uh, deterring uh, people who, who, who engage in this type of activity. Um, I'm going to move around the room. Rosemary? Rosemary? Yes, can you hear me? You got your Rosemary, yes. Okay, thank you. Um, you. You spoke earlier, Aaron, about the climate change act, and that was one of the most important, um, most one of the most important uh, outcomes that you were looking towards in the climate, the climate change action plan. And um, what consultation and what um, what work have you been doing with the agricultural community on that? Because the reason I say that is because you will be you will be aware in in uh, the press about a week ago there was a headline that said climate change will be capping our farmers in their in their progression etc. Uh, can you can you give me some uh, details on that then in the work you've been doing with farmers and how you how you're going to actually reassure them for the future and for the future succession of their farms? Thank you, uh, Rosemary. Yes, we, uh, we we are in the process now uh, of of uh, outlining uh, the the co-design uh, for for the green growth strategy, uh, and as I said, that will include you know the publication and the production of a climate action plan as part of that. Um, a part of that co-design uh, will involve uh, engagement with uh, stakeholders right across, and uh, we had um, an initial meeting. Uh, we've we've had engagement with uh, the farming unions. Uh, in, in recent months, but uh, a couple of weeks ago, we had a, a, a webinar for what we're calling a, a Green Growth Forum, and that included a lot of the key representative bodies, uh, not just in agriculture, but in the energy sector and and, uh, and transport and, and right across the board. Uh, and uh, they they were represented at that and got to hear how we're how we're developing the strategy uh, and what engagement they'll have going forward. Um, in terms of uh, the, the challenge that, that, that you know that faces agriculture here, um, there's there's no question. Uh, it was highlighted um, in um, uh, the the committee for climate change. Um, Piece that that came back on their sixth carbon budget, that uh, you know we're, we're uh, we've got a different uh, lifestyle, we've a different uh, agriculture sector relative maybe to other parts of the UK, uh, with a very um, you know uh, significant livestock uh, sector, and that will create particular challenges. Um, so uh, the reality there is that uh, you know farmers, landowners are are in, in are stewards for you know a million hectares of, of land in Northern Ireland, uh, and that land potentially can ca capture carbon. Um, uh, grassland can capture carbon. Um, you know peatlands that, that that are managed uh, and, and woodland that is managed uh, can can capture carbon as well. So as well as uh, looking at um, you know what farmers can do to reduce you. the production. Sorry, can you hear me? Uh, can you repeat to reduce that, production. Yes, as well as well as uh, farmers being able to maybe reduce the production of greenhouse gases uh, from their their systems, they also are in control of the land uh, area that potentially could could uh, could capture it. Um, so that's you know there there is a, there's a bit of a trade off there. Now I suppose the the. The challenge will be, um, and again, it'll link back into future agricultural policy, um, and we're very closely linked into the the team developing that. Um, how that policy will uh, enable farmers to, uh, to to contribute to the, redu the reduction of uh, carbon, uh, and also to uh, improve habitat and biodiversity on their farms. Um, how they will be able to. Uh, link into redu reduction in nutrients, excess nutrients causing the problems that uh, you know members have already referred to in water uh, and in air. So I mean, it will it will inevitably come back to you know what levers uh, we have at our disposal as a department or or even as an industry to uh, reduce the impact. Yeah, because I think farmers actually are very. A lot of farmers are extremely concerned. I've had a number of phone calls this week in relation to the Climate Change Act. And there are a number of people out there very, very concerned about the future of farming. Yes, they're prepared to play their part. There's no, no issue about that. But I, I do think that there seems to be a, 
and there needs to be a lot more education to, done, a lot more support given to them in relation to looking at the yeah. positives. Absolutely. Yeah, and I think that that's, I mean, it's, it's a really good point that you make because uh, what, what we're trying to do with green growth is not to look at anything in isolation. So uh, there is a challenge uh, for the agri sector in terms of uh, carbon reduction, but the sector has a lot more positives to contribute, both in terms of the food production, um, but also in terms of being able to uh, deliver the, uh, the, the, say, the, the biodiversity, the, the clean environment, Environment. You know, it has a lot of things there that it can do. Um, some some are quick wins, some will take a bit longer, but there's a lot that it can do. The other thing I just want to mention on on you know uh, you know as a sort of a, you know, we're 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 looking at the the, the challenge facing agriculture uh, and the livestock industry at this point in time from 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 now what we don't know is what will what will this look like in five years time and we're aware and um, because we've been doing some scoping work and, and landscape reviews that uh, in other parts of the world there's research ongoing in new zealand for example on uh, on uh, feed additives that can be put into remnant diets that actually reduce the amount of greenhouse gas product or the amount of methane produced and that's that's the key uh, greenhouse gas uh, i guess for agriculture so i mean you know, we don't know now, but it could be that in five years' time, we're we're clear that uh, you know that type of additive put into the feed, and that would be that would be a, a game changer if that is something that could be added to to animal feed that reduced the amount of uh, uh, methane production significantly, and then all of a sudden, you know, it's a very very different picture. But, but yeah. we, we can't look at we can't say that at this point in time. Thank you. And Aaron, just see on that point there, Rose, we just made, um, I think it'd be important also as well that if we're looking at another uh, round of the, the Farm Business Premium Scheme, that that um, that the, uh, that that's, that's considered, particularly for farmers of different sizes, because I, I actually had a meeting last night with a, an online meeting with a, people from the from the agriculture sector, and the point was made that they felt in the, the last Farm Business Improvement Scheme, for example, some of the equipment, some of the, the, the low emission spreading equipment was favoured the, the large farmers uh, greatly and had left the smaller farmers uh, you know, for example, there's things like the the dribble bars and and um, uh, and trailing shoe that doesn't suit to a lot of health farmers, for example. So I think it's important that that a future farm business improvement scheme uh, assists farmers to meet these targets under the ammonia action plan, but also assists all the different types of farmers uh, to make sure that that no one's left behind in a future scheme. If that's important, okay. Yeah, that's, that's, that's important. Uh, I'll take that one away because, uh, as you quite rightly say, we want to be able to ensure that uh, you know farmers, whatever their enterprises or their size are, you know, uh, are able to contribute. Yeah, that's important because it was it was a the consult it wasn't a consultation, it was just a bit of a local meeting with about thirty people from the sector, and that was a, a point that was raised a number of occasions that the smaller farmers um, felt um, that the farm business improvement scheme was not tailored. To the smaller farmer uh, and the type of equipment and the range of equipment and the that that was available. So please uh, just take that note of that there for any future tranche off the scheme. Uh, William, William, okay. William has temporarily gone off, but I'll, I'll move on to Harry and then come back to William. Harry, can you come in there? Yes, chair. Thank you very much. Uh, yes, appreciate it. Well, first of all, uh, thank you uh, for presenting today. First of all, I'd welcome the Green Growth Draft Strategy Action Plan. In fact, that it'll be ready in advance of the 26th um, year Climate Change Conference in Glasgow. That's a uh, good thing to aim for. It's always good to have something to aim forward, so that's great. Um, basically, reducing harmful gases, contaminants, chemicals, whatever, and they're cleaning up our air or water or soil. It's all great. I'm just wondering, I'm sort of following up from Rosemary, can this be done without hampering our agri-fruit production levels? In fact, I would like to think that you would tell me that it would enhance our production food um, production. And another thing I would just like to say, our agri-food sector here is second to none for quality. Will the quality also, if it's possible to be enhanced, be enhanced a little or 
what can you tell us about that? Thank you. Thanks, Chair. Uh, thank you. Yes, um, I would say that uh, you know when we've had any discussions on this, uh, one of the the key elements that comes forward is the fact that uh, you know Northern Ireland is a is an exporter. You know, we, you know we, we've built our agri-food industry on our exports and we've built it on quality um, and we've built it on integrity, food safety uh, and animal welfare standards. And increasingly, um, when we look at what consumers, not just here, but elsewhere are looking for, um, they're wanting the sustainability stamp. Uh, and, and credibility uh, put on to you know, whatever uh, they're buying. Um, and uh, so, for example, uh, you know, if we're able to produce, as we do, um, you know, grass-fed uh, dairy products, grass-fed beef, um, uh, and, and the elk, uh, you know, those are the sort of things that the more we can uh, underpin our exports uh, with that sort of level of environmental and climate credentials, uh, you know, the, the the more advantageous that will be to us, you know, securing, retaining, uh, and expanding some of the markets that we operate in. So I, I think it will be very much uh, something that uh, adds value to to Northern Ireland's agri food sector. Yeah. Okay. Uh, go ahead, there, Dave. Uh, so if I could just maybe add to what Aaron said, you know, ultimately, you know, I think a lot of this is about resource efficiency. You know, uh, and helping farmers to be resource efficient, you know, because you know, if every gram of nutrient that runs off from a field into a watercourse is, is a waste to the farmer and his system. You know, it, it, that could be used on farm, you know, to replace, uh, you know, border and fertilizers or the like. Uh, and equally with, with pesticides, you know, they they cost a lot. And if they end up, you know, spray drift or running into rivers, then that, that again is, you know, not the most efficient use of resources. So, you know, I think there's a, you know, a win-win to be had there uh, in, in terms of, you know, keeping this in a in a closed system, um, so that you know, the 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 money that farmers spend in in managing nutrients or or, or buying in fertilizers or pesticides is, is used efficiently, uh, and and you know, ultimately, uh, you know, enhances their productivity and and it has minimal environmental impact because it's to to their benefit, uh, you know, from from both of those aspects. Um, I, I... Sorry, change how we do things, support, modernize, and adapt without a fashion up. Yeah. Yeah, I think I think longer term too. Uh, you know, we we need to be aware that um, you know not everybody um, will be able to you know for example capture capture carbon. Um, some will be able to do that better than others. Um, and you know globally there is there is various um, carbon trading uh, schemes that operate. Uh, and I mean I think the industry here you know can potentially look at saying you know are there things that we can do that will allow us to capture carbon that will we will then get paid for. Uh, now that may may or may not be government paying it. It may actually be things like the um, you know the, the the aviation sector paying uh, you know. People, you know, paying farmers here to capture carbon for them to allow that to happen. So that that kind of carbon trading is another option that potentially would be open to, uh, you know, to 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 farmers who, who as I say, own, uh, you know, a million hectares of, of land here. Yeah. Thank you, Rose. We said the last thing we want to do is put our farmers off. They're getting it tight and Absolutely. hard. So encouragement. Yep. Yeah. Thank you very much, gentlemen. Thank you, Chair. That's me. Problem. Uh, William, are you back online there again? Yeah. Yeah, go ahead, William. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And maybe I can declare an interest in a farmer and a partner in an active farm, so I'm declaring interest in that. Can I say, like, I believe that the vast majority of farmers want to play their part in helping our economy or our, um, our environment and economy. But I mean, we have, a, we have a situation whereby um, a, our ammonia strategy is still not out there. Farmers are very anxious at the moment. Um, they are prepared to invest and do they play their part? Absolutely, and that can be proven by the Farm Business Improvement Scheme uptake at the moment. Uh, there's a big uptake. Uh, they want to play their part. 
We, we have a, a, an agri food sector that is the envy of many across the world, uh, and creating in the region of 100,000 jobs. So I think it's vital that we get this right. Uh, it's vital that the, we don't do our approach is sensible and it is, what we want to do is doable uh, and bring the agriculture and farming sector with us. Uh, do you, I'm sure you would accept that the department has a big role to play in this and not wanting to be critical of the department, I think we need, don't need to be dragging the feet any longer, we need, need to get our act together and move on these issues. Absolutely, uh, I, I, I totally agree. Uh, you know, we're, we're we're in a place now where um, you know we're we're trying to uh, you know through and again I suppose the subject of the program for government through program for government uh, through green growth. Uh, you know, a a, a real uh, recognition of the need for collegiate outcomes based focus, um, uh, and it will be for uh, you know uh, ministers and, and, and officials, senior officials to to really prioritize uh, and work in a way that will deliver against those um, and to give the confidence to uh, to, to farmers out there, you know, the long-term confidence that, uh, you know, a policy direction is set toward a specific outcome um, and, you know, that it won't change, you know, that that's the focus and then people can bank on that and they'll know that that's what they're working towards and that that's a really important point. Yeah, absolutely. Okay, William, you. uh, you're looking back in again there. Thanks very much, Chair. Um, just I, th I thought that was a fascinating um, question that Rosemary brought up there, and a great discussion that followed from it. Uh, and just following on from Declan's um, um, concerns that he was pointing out about, you know, basically a just transition for for smaller farmers. But I know that beef is being sort of talked about quite a lot as a huge carbon producer. But I'm wondering, is there a, um, any what what level of difference is being quantified within the department? for what I would class as a farmer, because most of our farms uh, and farmers would be small or medium. Um, a lot of them don't get good prices. We know about rural poverty and farmers living in poverty. Is there a difference being um, created within the department about how we move forward in making the difference between what is intensive factory farming, sort of the large corporate um, production models versus our regular small to medium farming sector and what supports that they need um because they're going to be very very different and when we're looking at the environmental problems i suppose and particularly in ammonia it's not coming from beef you know that's about the pigs and the chickens and that factory farming and intensification within that sector so is that being treated differently or taken on board at all um, uh, well, I'll let me kick off and happy for anybody to come in on that. But I think the answer, the short answer is yes, that it, it, it is being it is being considered in, in the round. Uh, um, it's it's not being treated differently, um, but it is being looked at as you know where, where the key. Um, I suppose what are the key contributors to the problems, um, and, and how can can uh, you know uh, any interventions be targeted in the right way to ensure that you know we're getting the the outcomes, and as you mentioned earlier, to get those quick wins. So if there's things we can do um, that will bring that about quicker by targeting, um, you know one group uh, over another if that's where the you know the problems originating then that that would be part and parcel of the approach that, that that would be taken but you know the reality is that is is being worked out at the minute through development of of future ag policy and uh, you know on day of side agri environment policy i suppose i'd just add to what aaron said in terms of future agricultural policy that you know one of the uh, underpinning principles would be around environmental sustainability and um, you know using money to support public goods yeah. and you know recognizing the, the differential between different farm types yeah. and so some smaller farms you know might be delivering more in terms of public goods you know in terms of you know people in sequestration uh, on on the hill or habitat provision or um, contributions to carbon sequestration or water quality um other farm types you know which perhaps more intensive you know the, the, the public goods and those might be less but they might be you know bringing in more profit and so the, the level of you know support might need to be tailored to recognize that 
Um, so that's, that's certainly something that's within the thinking uh, as the department looks at future agricultural policy. Um, I suppose just on, on the specifics of, of ammonia, um, you know, although the um, pigs and uh, poultry sector, you know, have, have perhaps a, a greater level of increase of ammonia emissions compared to other sectors, the, the beef sector still is the largest single emitter of ammonia. Uh, in in total, well, obviously, uh, you know, trends different between different sectors. Thanks for that. Okay. Okay, then, um, as we have uh, no other members down to ask question here, I would like to take this opportunity to thank Aaron, Dave, Michael, and David for uh, coming along here this morning and uh, giving us very comprehensive briefing on answering the questions very comprehensively as well. So thank you very much, and we will be uh, seeing you again uh, in the time ahead. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. Okay, members, uh, we'll move on now to item six on the agenda, which is a departmental written briefing at the Zionis uh, Order NI 2021. Memo from Stella is at page 43, a paper from the Department at page 45, along with a report from the Examiner Statutory Rules, which has been tabled. One of the members of the regulations are subject to the negative resolution procedure and are due to come into operation on the 25th of February. The committee last considered the regulations at the SL1 stage and its, its meeting on the 18th of February and indicated there was content with the merits of the policy. The ESR has advised the rules and breached the 21-day rule. However, she is content with the explanation provided to put the uh, department. So, um, uh, unless members have any comments about this here, <coughs> I will put the question, okay? Um, that the 25 Country Department Rule Affairs considered SR 2021 44, the Zonies Amendment Order NA 2021, there's no objection to rule, okay? Mm -hmm. Okay, members, uh, item number seven, a uh, written briefing from the department on the Green Growth Strategy. Uh, uh, the papers are on page 52, you're packed. The Green Growth Framework is the first step of the development of a more detailed strategy that will be consulted on. Um, it makes an overview of the work program, which includes significant data modeling, building, um, but, uh, but, uh, provision, uh, which includes significant data modeling, building on the analytical work undertaken by the Climate Change Committee. It also sets our approach to co-design and co-delivery and the proposed program. The department will be involved in the committee considers and, and comments on the draft strategy in advance of public consultation launch in due course. However, this stage, the department would welcome the committee's view on the framework. Um, do members uh, want to take a, a few minutes to take a look over that there? Um, um, uh, have you have any comments to make? Or maybe, um, can also members also check that their, um, their mics are, are muted as well? So that's page uh, 52 of your packs. Um, if you have any you can raise now. If not, you can forward them in to the uh, committee as, um, as uh, by the, later on today, till Stella. Members okay till uh, mm -hmm. consider the final send in there. Um, any questions you have to Stella by uh, later on today, by close play day? Okay. Mm -hmm. Okay, members, uh, item eight is a written briefing uh, on the, the EU transition. Uh, that's page 85. Again, any questions, please forward them to the clerk by uh, the end, by close of play today. And uh, we have a written briefing on water quality, page 95. And again, same thing, if members could take uh, the chance and read over it, and forward, for, fire, uh, forward any questions they have or comments to Stella, the clerk, by the close of play today. Okay, um, item 10, members on our agenda is uh, consideration of the independent panel on review of decisions. The request, I want to refer members to the request for legal advice as requested at last week's meeting at page 132, uh, papers uh, from the department of 136. And the table papers is an open letter from Barnwell Farms that will be added to the committee website and submitted as evidence to the minister. The draft committee position on this has been tabled for members' consideration. Uh, Barbara, can we bring you in to brief the committee, please? Thank you, yes. Good morning, Chair, and good morning, members. And thank Hi, you for Barbara. having me here. Hiya. Yeah. 
Um, so as you may well be aware now that um, this piece of work arose from concerns from stakeholders and members about the review of decision process for area-based schemes and particularly in relation to the independent panel. Following representations and a briefing from the department on the 28th of January, the committee agreed to look at this issue. Subsequently, views were sought and received from a number of key stakeholders, uh, namely the UFU, NIAPA, Agricultural Consulti Consultants Association, Farmers for Action NI, NI Farm Groups, and Brian Little and Mr. James O'Brien. And a research paper was also commissioned, and the committee considered this evidence at its meeting last week. So on the basis of that, I've prepared a paper for you to have a look at now and to get your views on. Uh, um, but just before you do that, I'll give you a quick run through of the key findings from stakeholders and also the recommendations that were put forward by committee members last week. Concerns were really raised in relation to the accessibility of information. So, for example, the use of legal jargon. And there's a recommendation in the paper around making information more accessible and more easily understood for appellants. In relation to evidence, uh, concerns were raised that only written information is, um, is admissible at the minute and also that new evidence is not allowed at the independent panel stage. So a recommendation has been included that other formats of evidence be admissible and also that evidence at the independent panel stage, uh, new evidence be allowed at that stage as well. In relation to the appointment of the independent panel, the committee uh, had suggested requesting more information on the proposals around the recruitment and selection process going forward um, that was referred to during the briefing with officials on the 20th of January. Uh, and I suppose this is really ne the next point is the key point that was made, uh, and that is around the decision of the independent panel. And on that point, all stakeholders agreed that the decision of the independent panel should be final. The minister has committed to bringing forward legislation to make sure that this is the case. And the department has also indicated in a letter to the committee that the minister will take the final decision in reviews heard by independent panels uh, going forward. Um, Certainly, uh, the feedback from stakeholders again was that historic cases should be looked at in the case where the independent panel uh, recommendation was not, not accepted, that those should be reconsidered. And there's a recommendation in that the decision of the panel should be final and also that, uh, that historic cases should be looked at. I'm just going to turn now to uh, judicial review. So concerns were raised by stakeholders around the use of the judicial review process to challenge a decision of the department where the appellant feels that the decision was wrong. This was seen as prohibitively expensive and also very stressful. Um, and it was pointed out uh, by stakeholders that the department hasn't wanted a judicial review. The committee heard oral evidence from Mr. Brian Little and Mr. James O'Brien on their proposals for a review mechanism, which would be not least, least ex less expensive. Uh, and their proposal was a Supreme Agricultural Appeals Panel, or SAP, the committee considered this proposal and expressed the view that it would need more time to consider the proposal and really find out what the implications are around the proposal. So that work is underway. Finally, and probably one of the most concerning aspects in all of this was the evidence of the severe negative impact the appeals process has on the mental health and well-being of appellants. And it was suggested that a recommendation be put to the department that they engage with organisations such as rural support and health services such as GPs to ensure that appellants have the support that they require. And Chair, if I may just also uh, make a couple of points in relation to the paper provided by Mark Allen, the research paper. He had suggested that um, the fee for the independent panel be looked at and also that um, targets around processing times uh, be considered. And the final point that I've made then in the, in the letter to the minister that I'm suggesting um, is that whenever the department is looking at the new agricultural policy, you know, that it looks at this process, is this process going to continue? Uh, what consideration has been given to make sure that it is fit for purpose in the years ahead? And also what programs will it apply to in the new agricultural policy? That's a very quick run through of the evidence and the recommendations. I've also included in Annex A uh, links to all of the evidence provided by uh, the uh, by the uh, witnesses and st uh, key stakeholders, which I would really be suggesting that per perhaps the department has a good look at that because there is more detail in there. Um, but at this stage, I'm just going to pass it back to you, Chair, now for, for consideration of the, the paper. Okay, uh, thank you, um, Barbara, for, for that uh, very detailed 
um, presentation. Um, before we take a, a, a look through the letter to the Minister, uh, John has asked for a question here. John? Thank you, Chair. It's a quick one. And thank you, Barbara, for, the, for that presentation and, and the detail you've provided. Um, quickly, you know I've raised the issue of the public recruitment process before and the openness and transparency around that. Should we at this point be saying more on that? I realise it's something that should be guided by the committee, of course, but, but it remains a, a major concern of mine that, that where there's public expenditure, there should be full accountability, openness and transparency. And um, I'm concerned that the committee should be flagging that up. Okay. Yeah. Yep. Okay. Thank you. Yes, I'm, I'm happy to add that in if, if, if the committee's content with that. Yeah, I think so. Okay. Um, okay. Okay, members. Um, if you can open up the your uh, table, the table pack papers, right? And we'll go through the letter to the minister, uh, page by page, to seek any uh, amendment or agreement. Okay. So, one of our members to the first page of the letter, a uh, page three, page three of your table pack. Okay. Page three. Okay. Um, are members okay? With uh, page page three, it's mostly factual information. Okay, okay, members, we're going to move now to page four. Page four of your table of your table pack. Yeah, that references the mental health and the GPs and um, those. And the evidence brought uh, to the panels. Okay. Numbers okay, page four. Okay, members, page five. Uh, the committee will look further information on the proposal for equipment selection in the panel. Uh, John, maybe is that's the bit that you're referring to, John, then? Uh, Item six about their uh, yeah. equipment selection of the independent panel. I, I would probably go further in, in recommending that that the that a public recruitment process should be undertaken. But I do understand point six there gives it the option to get that information, and that's probably okay. Okay, John. Okay, okay, members. Um, so that 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 was page five. Uh, okay. Uh, we'll now consider the annex to the letter. I want to refer members to page six. Um, so, if there's any comments on page. Six Annex A of the letter. Um, mostly factual as well. Page seven. Page seven of the table pack. Mostly factual information as well. Okay. Uh, page eight. Okay, we'll summarize the views of the Eye Culture Consultants Association. Uh, okay with that, members? Um, page nine, um, summary of MAPAs and ACANA's um, position on these matters as uh, witnesses, stakeholders. Page 10, we have a uh, summary of the UFU and uh, from Mr. Little and Mr. O'Brien and the begin uh, and obviously the, the SAEAP proposals. Members okay with that there as well? Okay. Okay, uh, page uh, uh, 11. Members okay, page 11, do the panel, the proposed panel. Okay, page 12, page 12 in your pack. The role of the ombudsman and start cases, consideration of evidence by the, the committee. Page 13, impact on mental health, the, the, the costs of JRs and other stuff like that. So members, okay with the, uh, page 13. Okay, and then on page 14, um, we have got uh, um, it's relation to uh, co correspondence in relation to the Barnwell Farms. Um, so if members are okay with uh, what we have drafted here, uh, uh,
can I seek agreement for the letter to issue to the minister? Uh, maybe strengthened up by some of your proposals, John? Yeah? Uh, uh, and place in the committee's web page. Is that fair enough? Um, can I can seek agreement that the committee informs all those who provided evidence to the committee that the letter has now issued and can be viewed in the web page? Okay. And I want to thank Barbara for her work and uh, wish you well, Barbara, in your new role in the Bills Office. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Chair. I appreciate that. And like I say, I'll see you all very, again very soon. <laughs> <laughs> and like I said before, at the, the committee's loss is the Bills Office game. So good luck, Barbara. Thank you very um, much and thank you, members. No problem. Take care, Barbara. Okay, members, item 11 uh, is the correspondence of page 166. Um, uh, the, I should say that the report from the uh, the examiner of the statutory rules has been tabled. Um, in relation to the uh, correspondence, are, are we happy to uh, um, action the correspondence as suggested on the index page of 163? Um, uh, can, can I also ask, just uh, in relation to that rural, the rural school in Brawla and from Anna, could, could, we, could we ask in terms of the action as well about um, has a, a about a rural needs impact assessment being carried out on that decision? Uh, I know it's a school, uh, which is technically not within our, our department's remit, but nevertheless, the rural impact would have. Well. It would be okay if we include that request as well about the rural, um, has there been a rural impact assessment being carried out on that decision? Yeah, yeah I would support that. Okay. Okay, members, if you know about things you want to raise. Okay. Okay, members. So um, that's great, members. So, well, thank you very much. And oh, we're going to have to go to close session. Uh, as it goes we're, we're going into a closed session here now, just we have, we have some issues to thrash out with mapping out our forward work program. So, I would like to ask broadcasting to bring us. Uh, to, to close us down now at this point here. And I want to thank members of the public. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly.